Again, a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today. This is one of our usual uh, monthly i um, lunchtime seminars. And I'm delighted today to introduce you Dr. Maria Doverman. Uh, Dr. Doverman is a newly appointed lecturer in youth mental health in the Institute for Mental Health. We're delighted to have her here with us today. Uh, and her talk is on childhood adverse events and mental health in, in adulthood. Uh, Maria has a background in cognitive neuroscience across several neurodevelopmental and mental health um, conditions. So we will follow the usual format uh, where um, Maria will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes uh, and then we'll take questions from you. Uh, do please uh, post your questions using the Q&A function and I will um, make sure uh, that we go through, uh, if we can, all of them uh, by the end of the, of the session. So, uh, Maria, a very, very warm welcome and uh, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. And I immediately jump into the slides. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. Can I very quickly check? Thank you, Maria. <laughs> the thumbs up. Okay. Sorry, I just very quickly need to move this out of the way. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for joining everyone. I know I started with a slightly provocative question here. Of course, we're going to talk about the link between childhood adverse events and mental health conditions typically occurring in early adulthood. And I specifically want to explore this question, are there only negative consequences in individuals with mental health conditions when they've experienced childhood adverse events? And of course, as you can imagine, the answer isn't as simple as yes or no. So we have a closer look at this. And in particular, I'm going to have a few examples for you looking at individuals with schizophrenia, looking at young people with major depressive disorder, and looking at young people when we consider anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, but also obsession symptoms. Starting right at the beginning. We know that about one third of everyone in the general population will have experienced childhood adverse events at some point through their life. Or in other words, one in three people, including all of us here in this round. And when we speak about childhood adverse events, we typically speak here about childhood trauma. So for example, neglect types or abuse types, specifically physical neglect and emotional abuse, but this may also involve other experiences, for example, poverty or bullying during adolescence. At the same time, we also know that about one quarter of the general population will experience a mental health condition during their lifetime. And we also know that typically mental health conditions begin during adolescence and young adulthood. And this is really important for bringing both pieces together, bringing the experience of childhood adversity events and the development of mental health conditions together. And the reason is that we believe that childhood adverse events may lead to detrimental consequences during development, during childhood and adolescence, in particular, looking at emotional development, cognitive development, and that also includes brain development, both brain structure and brain function. And this may be also one of the reasons why we find that more individuals with a mental health condition report to have experienced childhood adverse events than people without a mental health condition. But let's have a closer look at our overall question. How can we actually break this down to get a better idea, to get a better handle on this one? These ones are only exemplary questions. We can't cover all of them here, but let's start with some. So the first question may be, do childhood adverse events always lead to mental health conditions in all individuals? Sure, they do not. We know this already, that not everyone will develop a mental health condition, but it may lead to another question. 
what do we know about factors that may lead to mental health conditions in some individuals? And we will call these factors risk factors from here on. We immediately jump to another question, jumping into those who will not develop a mental health condition. What do we know about those factors? And we will call these factors resilient functioning factors from here on. And finally, how can we promote resilient functioning in the face of childhood adverse events to help those people who may be prone or more vulnerable to mental health conditions to not develop any kind of mental health problems? And we call these factors here protective factors. And we can then plot all of these together. And this one will also be the outline of this presentation that we speak about risk factors, protective factors, and resilient functioning factors. And I will start by presenting two examples based on two studies where we talk about childhood adverse events as one of many risk factors for a potential onset of mental health condition, in particular focusing here on biological and biological factors. And here I will speak about the IRELATE study, which stands for Immune Response and Social Cognition and Schizophrenia Study. And this one was an island-based study, European Research Council funded. And here we look at individuals with schizophrenia and healthy participants, and all of them experienced childhood adversity. And then we have another look at another study, HOPES, which stands for Help Overcome to Predict the Emergence of Suicide in Young People with Major Depressive Disorder. Then we will go on to have a closer look at protective and resilient functioning markers and move here into the field of longitudinal studies. And here I present an example based on the ROOT study, which is a youth development study to have a closer look at protective and resilient functioning markers but then also to go into the area of opportunities towards resilient functioning and positive outcome informed by individuals with or without lived experience so that they can guide us in our research and to see what answers we can find to our questions at the beginning. Starting with psychosis or in this case specifically looking at individuals with schizophrenia, here we consider the role of childhood adversity events as one single major risk factor for the development of psychosis. And we do know quite a bit about this. For example, looking at clinical symptoms, we do know that individuals with schizophrenia who report to have such an experience during their childhood or adolescence, that they report more severe clinical symptoms and that the onset was earlier than in individuals with schizophrenia who did not experience these experiences. And we do know quite a bit about that childhood adversity may lead to cognitive deficit, may lead to alterations of brain structure and brain function, and including immune system, cortisol, stress system, and different neurometabolites, for example, glutamate. For today, though, I focus specifically on cognitive function and brain connectivity, and specifically here, emotion recognition. And we're diving immediately into this. And this one is one of these examples from the IRELATE study that I mentioned earlier on. I was a project lead on this study, and with a huge team, a lot of people worked on this. We recruited about 150 individuals with schizophrenia and about 250 healthy participants. And the majority of all of these participants reported childhood adversity levels measured with the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire, or short CTQ and they underwent resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what this means is that people are lying in the scanner, but they are not completing a task. What we are interested in is how their brains function while they are just resting. Starting here with the top of the picture, looking here at our brain plots, we found that across all participants, so all individuals with schizophrenia and healthy participants, we found that there was reduced functional connectivity between the right lateral parietal lobe and the precuneus. We also found an illness-specific effect, and we can see this here on the bottom, 
where on the x-axis, we have plotted functional connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum. And on the y-axis, we have the total score, score of our childhood adversity levels. And what we see here is that we found a significant positive association between increased childhood adversity levels and increased function connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum, but only in individuals with schizophrenia. When we then had a closer look specifically at physical neglect as one of the subtypes of the childhood trauma questionnaire, and emotion recognition performance here assessed with a CANTAP task, we found that reduced function connectivity between the parietal cortex and the precuneus that we found previously across all individuals significantly mediated the relationship between physical neglect and emotional recognition deficits. And importantly, this is a finding both in healthy participants and individuals with schizophrenia. We did not find a moderating effect of diagnosis of schizophrenia, despite the earlier in a specific finding. We interpret this finding as an indication that alterations of brain networks may help us to better understand this link between physical neglect and emotional recognition performance. And this may be important for the development of future cognitive trainings, in this case, specifically looking at emotion recognition. And we know that emotion recognition is often impaired in individuals who have experienced childhood adversity. But here, of course, we only considered childhood adversity as one single risk factor and relative simple associations. Today, I'm not going into any examples of how alterations of the immune system, cortisol stress system, or neurometabolites may also be involved in this, but these projects are ongoing and other research groups are, of course, also working in this one. So I hope to present on this in the near future. So I mentioned that in the previous findings, we consider childhood adversity as one single risk factor, but it can also be assumed, well, as a matter of fact, we do know that there are several risk factors always interplaying with each other. And this one may actually resemble a more realistic view of how a specific mental health condition may occur. So here's an example of the help overcome and predict the emergence of suicide study or short hopes. And the study here focused specifically on youth suicide and suicidal thoughts and behaviors in order to, to contribute to the huge search in finding better understanding of how we can actually reduce the huge number of young adolescents and young people who commit suicide, which unfortunately is a huge public health concern. Here's an example of how we try to do this as part of an international collaboration between the University of Melbourne, Origin, Yale uh, University in the States and University of Cambridge. And I led one of the three research aims, but they all come together in one huge package. Laura van Welsen started with the first research aim which is about revealing the brain mechanisms that make young people diagnosed with a range of psychiatric illnesses more vulnerable to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And she in particular focused on structural brain measures that may help us understanding this. And she particularly focused on major depressive disorder and bipolar disorders in young people. Based on that, Leila Kolic, she led the second aim. She was based at Yale University at the time. And this aim was about identifying what brain mechanisms predict future suicidal thoughts and behaviors in young people, both in people with major depressive disorders and bipolar disorder, and whether this can be changed through talking therapy, in particular cognitive behavioral therapy. And bringing both of these findings from these two research aims together, I then led the third aim which is about examining how the brain interacts with the social environment, in particular here looking at peer and family relationship problems, including bullying, to make young people more vulnerable to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And I mentioned already that major depressive disorder itself as a mental health condition 
is a major risk factor towards suicidal ideation. So here we focused specifically on a suicidal ideation model using data from individuals with major depressive disorder. In addition to the risk factor of major depressive disorder and early life stress that you know already, which in this case here included childhood adversity, specifically defined as recent stressful experiences defined as problems with friends and families within the last 12 months. Another risk factor was also structural brain alterations known to be involved in suicidal ideation in adults, but also known to be involved in rumination, which led us then to the third risk factor of rumination or excessive negative thinking to piece all of this together. And based on the knowledge, we also proposed that each of these mechanisms of these three major risk factors may predict severity of suicidal ideation in our young people with major depressive disorder. But actually, the indications in the literature that we also need to in take into consideration the interrelationships among the three risk factors in order to complete the overall picture. So in order to do this, we ran structural equation modeling to build this biopsychosocial model of suicidal ideation. And we immediately dive into our main findings here. I want to draw your attention to the red and black pathways. The red pathways denote significant path coefficients and the black one non-significant ones. So what we can see here is that a greater number of early life stressors were significantly associated with reduced surface area measures of specific brain regions. We also found that increased levels of rumination were significantly associated with reduced surface area of the same brain regions. And finally, that increased rumination scores were significantly associated with greater severity of suicidal ideation in our young people with major depressive disorder. And this is a very specific finding only for suicidal ideation when that we did not find in suicidal attempt in the same individuals, despite the fact that we used exactly the same risk factors. And this is not surprising because this model here was specifically built around the role of rumination on suicidal ideation, but taking the other factors into consideration. We interpret this finding as an indication that interventions should focus on using specific psychological therapies or CBTs to reduce ruminative tendencies in addition to depressive symptoms in young people. And that may hopefully lead to reduced levels of suicidal ideation scores overall. So in total, here we propose based on these findings that early life stress risk factor is still involved within this overall model through intricate interrelationships with other risk factors that should be taken into consideration for future studies. We come back to our brief outline. And of course, this last study also has its own limitations. Similar to the iRELATE study, both of these findings were related to cross-sectional studies. And that, of course, is a problem because it doesn't allow us to actually interpret the data in terms of long-term predictions. But that is exactly what we need in order to get a better idea about protective and resilient functioning factors. So the next example I will show is based on the ROOT study, which is a 10-year longitudinal study based on youth development, and that was run in the University of Cambridge. And I use this example to show a protective factor of good quality of friendship support during early adolescence. We define this by age 14 and resilient functioning at age 24. And I'm, of course, going to give you a definition because, as you may know, Resilience is an umbrella term, specifically when we talk about resilience after the childhood adversity experience. And there, there's a wealth of definitions out there. So it's really important to, to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Until recently, most people would define resilience as capacity, which is typically described as coping with future stress 
So here we talk about any kind of capacity that may be inherent in us. Then we talk about the process, which is about an adaptive response to stress that has just happened. And this may be, this process, an adaptation process may be that we develop mental health problems, which you would consider being typical and healthy after such an immense stressor. And then we talk about outcome, which is typically seen as the absence of mental health problems. But there are also other definitions. For example, the resilience framework, which has recently been proposed by Kalish. You see, it's a similar approach of how to define resilience, but he goes one step further. He begins defining resilience factors, which are about dynamic and stable traits that aid capacity when future stress may happen. He talks about resilience mechanisms, which reflects a process of adaptation. And finally, he speaks about resilient functioning, which denotes good mental health and well-being. And as you can see here, this definition of resilient functioning is not necessarily dependent on a clinical diagnosis, although it may include symptoms. So how can we now define resilient functioning in young people? Here use an example from the ROOT study. And as you can see here, we use data across four different waves. Individuals, young people came in at four time points, age 14, age 15.5, age 17, and age 24. And at each of these time points, data was collected both on self-reports and parents' reports covering well-being, adaptation, academic performance, feeling, but also psychological functioning and also symptoms of depression, anxiety, obsession, and antisocial behavior. And all of these different measures went into the quantification of degree of resilient functioning, which was defined the following way. Psychosocial functioning that was better than in others with similar childhood adversity experiences. And we come back to this in a second. As part of the study, all of these individuals were also invited to undergo functional magnetic resonance, resonance imaging, and in particular to play the cyberball game, which is an established social exclusion game, which is known to quite robustly induce social distress. And the overall idea of this study, focusing here on wave four was, to see if the protective factor of good quality peer, uh, early adolescent friendships assessed at age 14 could predict resilient functioning at age 24. But first we have a closer look at our resilient functioning measure. Here on the x-axis, we plotted severity of childhood adversity across all three previous waves. On the y-axis, we plotted psychosocial functioning, again, based on all previous three waves, actually plus the fourth, fourth wave. And this psychosocial functioning is based on depression, anxiety, obsession, and antisocial behavior symptoms. And what you can see here is that we begin to have an individual degree of resilient functioning. Each of these dots reflect one individual, and each dot across a regression line reflects an individual who shows better resilient functioning than expected given the severity of childhood adversity and a dot below the regression line denotes exactly the opposite worse psychosocial behavior given the severity of childhood adversity we were then interested in bringing this together with brain responses to get a better idea of what may be going on during social exclusion so I mentioned we were interested in examining whether friendships at age 14 could predict resilient functioning at age 24. And what we found was we found significant positive associations between resilient functioning and increased activation of the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, but also very similar association in good quality friendships at age 14 with increased activation of the medial prefrontal cortex. And these findings led us to actually run a mediation analysis. And indeed, we found that this increased dorsal 
medial prefrontal cortex activation specific to exclusion significantly mediated this relationship between friendships at age 14 and resilient functioning at age 24. And importantly, we interpreted these findings based on the dorsal and medial prefrontal cortex activation as an aspect that this may reflect the good friendship support, meaning that individuals, despite the experience of childhood adversity, were able to recognize their own emotions and to cognitively reappraise their emotions in order to work towards resilient functioning as their outcome measure. As always, this study, of course, has also a limitation. And in this case, the main limitation is that we did not have a control group who did not experience childhood adversity events. Working forward on our outline, so we know quite a bit about protective factors. Here we have seen one example, but there are also wells of other protective factors, typically in the field of emotional support, social support, and how this one can be interrelated to psych psychological and biological factors. But nonetheless, it is important that we also learn from young people with or without mental health conditions and from individuals with lived experiences of both childhood adversity events and mental health conditions to guide us of what we should actually focus on, what we should actually get better at to learn and to improve so that we can help everyone. And here I present two findings. Firstly, an ongoing project based on our youth advisory group here in our Institute for Mental Health and one special interest group, Developmental Trauma and Psychosis Network. Starting with our ongoing project. So all the credit here actually goes to other people, not me, not me. And the credit here goes specifically to our six young advisors who are part of this ongoing project. And they are part of a bigger group here in the IMH. All of them are between 18 to 25 years old and have an experience of mental health or a strong interest in youth mental health. Also huge credit goes to Charlotte and Naya, who are our, who are our youth involvement co-leads, and Renate is also leading this project with me. And here in particular in this project, we're interested in safeguarding and protecting young people who participate in mental health research. For example, in health, mental health research, where we're collecting data on potentially sensitive data of childhood adversity, how we can make sure that these young people are safe which will also help us to gain better data and to actually interpret the data better. So here's an example of how we went about this. Um, this is a brief example of our first out of three sessions. And I do want to mention that before I actually summarize our main points of our group discussion based on this first session, that we were very much aware of that we need to have safeguarding literally in place while we run this project. So Naya and Charlotte are actually really, really important in this space here that every young advisor knew absolutely surely that whenever they were struggling at any kind of level with any potentially sensitive information that may pop up, that they can always get in touch with our two main youth involvement co-leads, which is really, really important. Otherwise, this whole project would never have a chance. So when we focused then on our group discussion, we focused on potential harms of involvement when there's no safeguarding and no protection in place, existing ways to safeguard young participants in the future and areas of development in general. And here's an example based on a Padlet activity as everyone, we also did this via Zoom. And we created separate questions and you see two examples here. One that was about what does a safe space feel like when participating in interviews, focus groups? And the other question was about how can researchers ensure that a safe space is maintained after participation has ended? And when you skip through these answers, you can see that it's all about making sure to involve all of these young people as individuals, to take them seriously, to tell them what all of this research is about and that it's not just about extracting the research data, but that it's really about overall 
management and that we are staying with them. And you see, for example, one point of sending follow up emails a few days after that it's really showing true and genuine interest in the young people. One outcome of our first session was that we want to create a safe space as part of a research study and that we are working and currently we are working on building these guidelines. And thank you for Maria based on your GP uh, guideline. We also worked with this one, which is really, really helpful to actually create three time points before a research study starts, during a research study and after a research study, which allows us to define specific aspects of how we want to build our guidelines. So for example, before the research study starts, to provide an overview of the research project with focus on resilient functioning. So even though we would collect data on childhood adversity to always give a broader concept that we're not just interested in these potentially triggering events, but that we're actually interested in the bigger picture that we want to work towards the future. During the research, we may actually focus more on providing contact with the same person instead of having three different research assistants running different kind of aspects of a study. And an example for after a research study to actually maintain contact even when the research study itself has completed. Another example of how we may move the field forward is this special interest group. It's a relatively new group. It's led by Michael Bloomfield at the University College London. And it brings together researchers from around the world and across quite a lot of disciplines because a lot of people realize that we need to bring different disciplines together in order to, to get a better idea of what we're actually looking at. And here we actually have basic researchers, clinical researchers from around the world. We have clinical psychologists and psychiatrists involved. Most of us are based here in Europe, actually in the UK. We have a few people in the United States and Canada, but we also have researchers in South Africa and in Australia. And one of the current things we are working on, which has just started, is that we want to define a consensus statement on the relationship between developmental trauma and psychosis by defining research priorities and clinical re recommendations using the approved Delphi process. And you can see here that one of these critical aspects, again, is to actively engage with stakeholders and actors so that they can guide us so that we can learn from them and what direction we need to go. What are actually important protective factors? What are actually important resilient functioning markers? What do we actually need to focus on? Coming to a bit of a summary, trying to piece all of this a little bit together. I've put these questions up earlier on and now it seems like I didn't actually ask quite the right questions because now we actually end up with more questions than we started with. Some example questions that we now want to ask, uh, is it always disadvantageous to have mental health challenges at times? Can we learn from the experience of childhood adverse events for building psychosocial functioning? A lot of these questions here about what, how, when do we know that we need to intervene? Uh, what do we need to learn about the onset of a specific mental health condition? Focusing on resilient function markers, again, it's a lot about how do we build resilient functioning? How do we develop cognitive training programs? How is it actually useful for people? And very similar for protective factors, how do we promote good quality peer friendships? How do we actually protect young people? So all is about how we can make use of this information so that it actually reaches the people who really need it. And therefore we need input like young advisory people from our groups. One way, certainly not the only, but one way is to create a biopsychosocial model of resilience. And of course, there are different psychosocial models of resilience already out there in the world. And very similar to this one here, they are defined and focused on very specific aspects. So firstly, focused on a specific mental health condition, in this case, multiple sclerosis. Also focused specifically on a target group, adolescents and young adults, and even further defined of 
adolescents and young adults who are newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And this is really important because unless we actually target our biopsychosocial models, we're actually going to miss very specific factors, very specific pieces of the puzzle. And as you can see here in this study protocol, they're bringing together clinical, social, psychological, and biological characteristics to piece all of this together. And as with any biopsychosocial model, it's really important to always think about interdependencies between all of these different factors. And that, of course, is crucial to get these bits right. So what does this mean for the experience of childhood adversity or using this example here, childhood maltreatment? You have seen this figure in a very similar form earlier on. Um, and this figure, it's called childhood maltreatment, but we're still speaking about exactly the same thing, about childhood adversity or childhood adverse events. Just as a reminder, on the x-axis, we look here at the severity of childhood adversity. And at the y-axis, we look at psychosocial functioning derived from depression, anxiety, obsession, and antisocial behavior symptoms. And we defined this earlier on and again here as psychosocial functioning that was better than in others with similar childhood maltreatment experiences. But now we have a closer look at our two individuals, A and B. A, for example, represents an individual who has experienced moderate levels of childhood adversity and has lower resilient functioning scores than individual B with lower psychosocial functioning who experienced severe childhood maltreatment. And the critical question here, of course, is how can that happen? How can these two individuals respond so differently? It may help us to zoom out of this picture a little bit and to have a closer look at protective resilient factors. And you see a range of proposed factors here covering environmental, cognitive, brain function, brain structure, neuroendocrine, inflammatory and genetic risk factors. One could actually add even more than them. One thing I do want to add for the cognition bit, these cognitive functions here are technically actually more psychological functions. We may also add here emotion recognition, cognitive reappraisal, cognitive control, cognitive inhibition, etc. All of these cognitive functions that we also know are involved and actually closely interlinked with these psychological functioning measures and brain structure and brain function. And again, the last point I want to point out here is that each of these protective and resilient factors are closely interlinked with each other. And that of course makes sense because using this overview here based on this complex neurobiology of resilient functioning, we know about a lot of interrelationships between each of these factors. This one here is not a complete list of trying to piece everything together, but it is an attempt of trying to bring different kind of biological, psychological and social levels together by combining different kind of factors. And finally, to do this specifically for resilient functioning after the experience of childhood adversity. So one can go a step further now and should indeed, and that's what I propose to do in my research, to use a similar approach, but now to actually focus on specific mental health conditions. Because now we still need to focus on specific target groups, on specific mental health conditions to get a better idea. Here I propose to do this with the experience of childhood adversity as a risk factor, but there are also other risk factors, for example, genetic factors or positive family history of mental health within the core family. Co-production is a huge aspect of any kind of research to always get input from interested and affected people so that they can guide us when we don't know to of course use longitudinal data so that we can actually run predictive studies, for example, using the adolescent brain cognitive development data sets or the RACE data set, which is also a Cambridge-based data set specifically set up to study mechanisms of childhood adversity. But it's also important to set up new longitudinal studies so that we can actually use optimal factors that may not be inherent, for example, in the ABCD data set. 
And finally, we need to use appropriate statistical analyses that can actually deal with these complexities of all of these relations and interrelationships. One can do this with structural equation modeling if there is at least a good level of knowledge for these relations and interrelations. Or one can go rather into the field of machine learning approaches when this knowledge is not quite as settled. So let's come back to our questions. Can we piece some answers together now based on what we've covered so far? Looking at the first question, do childhood adverse events always lead to mental health conditions in all individuals? Well, we kind of knew already from the start that that's not true. We know that such experience may lead to mental health conditions in some individuals, but not in others. And we certainly need to learn a lot more about complex processes, about individual developmental processes, but also development of specific mental health conditions. And you will see very similar answers for each of these bits. We do know a little bit about risk factors, protective and resilient functioning factors, but we still need to learn a lot more about piecing all of these different piece, uh, puzzle pieces together so that we actually understand of what we're looking at. We still need to bring it a lot closer together. And finally, we really need to work on reducing occurrence of adversity, minimize the known risk factors, offer support and protection, because often, we forget about this critical bit. What about our overall question? What does that mean? One of our questions was, are there only negative consequences in individuals with mental health conditions? No, we surely have seen that this is not quite true and that it may also depend on the definition of resilience as an outcome, where clinical diagnosis is very likely not the out end point, and where the immediate coping response after the experience of adverse events may actually be visible in mental health problems. So mental health problems themselves are actually not the problem or the outcome. We have seen that both healthy participants or individuals with any kind of mental health condition can be affected by childhood adverse events. Mental health challenges in themselves can be a risk factor as seen in the suicidal ideation study. But protective and resilient functioning factors can help us to learn more about positive consequences. And overall, again, we need to, to listen more and to learn more about affected individuals' experiences and opinions to guide us. Finally, I want to thank a lot of people. In particular, I want to Thank everyone involved in the iRelate study back from Ireland. I also want to involve a lot of people from the Risk and Resilience Group and the HOPES Group. But I also want to acknowledge Scottish Family Mental Health Study and the LEAP study, which are really, impl really important in getting all of these ideas together. And I hope to present findings on these bits in the future. And finally, even though I'm just here about two and a half months, at the IMH. I really want to thank everyone already, including and particularly our youth advisory group, to already help with creating new research ideas and creating new research projects. And thank you very much to you, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, yes, we've got 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I've got one for you. Um, I've got two for you. Excellent. So there is evidence suggesting uh, that adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, do not contribute equitably to outcomes such as the one you discussed. Have you looked at the co-occurrence of ACEs and or at their chronicity and recency? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. I very obviously did not present any findings on these aspects, even though it's incredibly important. Uh, and if I could actually add a few to-do list uh, points on the to-do list, in addition to the ones that you raised, it's um, timing of childhood adversity events, subtypes, um, that are all very important to gain a better understanding of the complex interplay. In these studies here, we were not able to look at these specific questions, even though we know that they're very important. And the main reason for that is that the measurements that were used 
to look at childhood adversity simply did not allow us to, to have big enough sample sizes, which is a huge shame, but uh, it's absolutely one of the big things that needs to be done in the future, absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I've got one more question from you and, uh, and, and also thanks for an excellent presentation. Uh, yep. I'd like to ask whether there is evidence of pathways to mental health conditions that are specific to adversity and so different from pathways to the same conditions for people without adversity. This seems to inform whether there should be similar or different approaches to treating, helping individuals with a condition, depending on whether they have experienced adversity. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. Um, I don't think anyone knows the answer to your question. I think it's a absolutely critical key question to ask. And if we knew the answer, that would help us immensely, even if it was just in one specific mental health condition, I think it would, would move the field forward without end. Um, to my knowledge, no one knows this, because at this point, we look at increased likelihoods, at increased probabilities of increased vulnerability that a mental health condition may occur in the future. And we are not even good at predicting what mental health condition. Um, so it's, we don't have the knowledge, but it would be incredibly important to do this. And I hope that with more defined, more focused um, biopsychosocial models that we may actually get closer to this, to actually drill down onto a specific mental health condition, possibly even a specific stage of a mental health condition in a very specific focused group uh, in order to make progress with that. And we need actually mechanistic studies for that. Otherwise, uh, we'll always get stuck on the uh, relationship association level. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Um, we've got another uh, question and comment said that was a great presentation and well explained. Uh, is it possible that mental health conditions that present later in adult life a result subsequent from adverse childhood experiences alone? I'm taking my sweet time answering this question because I would say, hypothetically speaking, it is possible, but I'd say it's unlikely. Um, the critical bit, of course, is how I get to this answer. Based on the knowledge we, we always speak very often as if the experience of childhood adversity was one of the most important ones and therefore would override any other potential risk factors. We seem to look at findings where that is not true. It seems to play a huge role. Yeah, I'm not saying at all that, that there are no detrimental negative consequences or that there may be in some individuals to be more correct. But it seems like that rather the cumulative load of several risk factors and several vulnerabilities that may come together further increase the risk. If you ask me now what our knowledge based on this is, oh, quite spotty. So we do know about um, genetic vulnerability, for example, based on specific uh, genetic markers or genetic manipulations, for example, bringing this together with a positive mental health history of first degree relatives and potential living in poverty that tremendously increases the likelihood of developing a mental health condition. But we still don't know what mental health condition that may be, even if the individual would develop this one. Mm -hmm. A lot of work to do. Thank you, Maria. And I, I can definitely relate to that in, in relation to sort of research in self-harm and, and, and suicide as well, that it's, it's rarely the outcome of a single factor. It's usually a snowballing effect, a cumulative effect uh, of sort of increased vulnerability that builds up. Um, yeah, wonderful. Um, we've got another um, question here. Fabulous talk, many thanks. We have heard over the pandemic that children may have experienced more adversity whilst in lockdown and away from school. Has this been clearly demonstrated and should we expect to see more adverse outcomes in young people in the future? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um... 
to my knowledge, there are a few preprints out, but not a published paper yet that specifically identifies this clear relationship. Um, and these few preprints seem to, to paint a picture that, that it seems to be true for some individuals, for some young people, but not for others. So what I mean mm -hmm. with this is that for young, some young people, the lockdown may have actually been brilliant to not have to go into school, to not have been exposed to bullying, that that in a way may have been a protective factor, but only in the case that the home family or home was a safe space. Um, some of these preprints show that we need to have a closer look at what subtype of adversity we look at. If we actually look at childhood maltreatment, childhood mal uh, adversity that may happen in the home with the family, or more that is school-based. Um, so there, that goes in different directions. Um, and the second part is, I'm thinking specifically about uh, two preprints that sadly enough are actually linked to suicidal ideation and suicidal attempt, because that seems to be one of the conditions that seem to have spiked a lot in adolescents and young adults during the lockdown which potentially, but that's not quite clear yet, may have been induced by childhood adversity. Or these preprints actually seem to suggest that it's more in the lack of protection and safeguarding, that the level of adversity was actually the same. Um, so, sorry, to come to your last question. So sadly enough, I, I would say we may have to look at higher prevalence levels. Um, but that may not necessarily be because childhood adversity has happened more often in a lot of the cases because protection and safeguarding has not been in place as much as it should have been. Uh, and we need to work very, very strongly to get this back up and running. Yeah. Sorry, Maria, can I go back to your comment about uh, sort of lockdown and, and uh, suicide? So just to be clear, we, we haven't got any evidence that uh, deaths by suicide in young people have increased during lockdown. That is not supported, that is not the case. I think it's important that we make this clear, but there might be increase in suicidal ideation and associated distress. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely, and thank you for clarifying this. When I answered, yes. I, I said suicidal no, thoughts no, no, and no. behavior and, and yeah. treated them as if they were the one yeah. and same thing. You're absolutely correct. There, there is a dis discrepancy between, we, we see a higher prevalence of suicidal ideation mm -hmm. and luckily so far, um, mm -hmm. not in completed suicide attempts. Yeah, that yeah. is absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So that leads me to my next question, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is really interesting, by the way. So you've looked at early uh, life stress and links with um, suicidal ideation. So you use suicidal ideation as, a, as an outcome. And I was wondering, would you do, have you looked at suicidal behavior? For example, have you looked at self-harm with and without intent? Yes, we did. Um, mm. But we used a relatively crude measure for this. And what okay. I mean with this, um, so for suicidal ideation, we used uh, severity levels, um, simple, yeah. straightforward, continuous score. For suicidal attempts, um, we had to use uh, no yes measure, absence or presence yeah. measure. And yeah. this was mainly due to the fact that, fortunately, in this specific sample, the occurrence of suicidal behavior was actually relatively low. And this could be explained by the fact that the data that we used for our analysis was part of an ongoing randomized clinical trial okay. where they had very close, constant clinical uh, yes. contact. Yes, yes. Um, yes. And when you're referring to suicidal uh, behavior, are you, are you referring to attempted suicide? So is both that, is attempted, that... aborted, uh, and actually included, uh, completed. Okay. So it's a very good measure of actually piecing all together. Um, so yeah. you're absolutely right. One actually would need to, to have a closer look, even of differentiating suicidal and non-suicidal self harm. That in itself is a, is, is very important. Exactly. This is exactly where I was thinking. Whether you would have, you would be able to look at self harm, uh, of where it's you know self injury irrespective of uh, of intent. 
um, as opposed to an attempted uh, suicide. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and hopefully longitudinal large data sets uh, will help yeah. with that to, to get the number and the power together. Wonderful. Okay, um, I don't think we've got any more uh, questions. Um, so I think we can we can bring this to a close. And Maria, this was an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, and, and very, very interesting, as you have seen from love, a great breadth of questions that we've that we've got. So thank you so much for being with us today, virtually, <laughs> hopefully in the future in face to face as well. Thank and you very much for having me. No, thank you. That was that was amazing. Thank you. And and just to say that this is the uh, last uh, talk for 2021. Uh, we will have a little break now. Uh, there, there's not going to be a talk in, in January, but we will reconvene in, in, in February and, and details of the events will be, uh, will be shared very soon. Uh, we will also share uh, Maria's talk as it has been uh, recorded. So thank you all very much for joining us today. I hope you have a lovely Christmas. And Maria, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone.